Now I have the very great pleasure of introducing you to our speaker today, Mark Dennis, curator at the Museum of Freemasonry. And Mark will give us a talk about Freemason art in times of war and conflict. And Mark, this is indeed a very interesting topic. Over to you. Thanks, Jane. Uh, well, good evening, everybody. Thanks for coming along to here to talk about art from a trench. Well, actually, it's a lot more complicated than that, and I hope a lot more interesting. I probably should explain how it got its name. In the First World War, for the first time, families from all over the country sent their loved ones off to fight in the war. They got letters back, but sometimes they also got gifts. Not things you could buy on a high street because, of course, the servicemen couldn't get them. But things made carved out of the bunk banks they were living in. Things made from bullets that they'd fired. Even bullets themselves, there was a, a superstition that the bullet that would kill you would have your name on it. So logically, if you engrave your name on a bullet and send it to your wife, you're immortal. Well, maybe. But it helped to make people feel part of their communities and just more human. After the war, their families went on pilgrimages to the battlefields, to where their loved ones had served and very often died. And very similar items were on sale because the villagers um, in France and Belgium had lost everything. The one thing they could do was collect the vast amounts of bullets and shell cases and debris of war and turn them into things that they could sell to the battlefield pilgrims. No one had ever seen stuff like this before. It was new. And it got the name trench art because most of it came from the Western Front and service in the trench systems. But actually, it's not like that at all. Um, today, we use trench art as a catch-all term for items that have been used in or been affected by conflict. So it can be made from a bullet that you've fired or the ruins of a building that's been bombed and which meant something to you when it was in one piece. The idea goes all the way back to ancient times. The ancient Romans, when they won a victory, would gather up the helmets, the shields, and the swords of their defeated foe and make a massive artwork, which they called a, a trophy of arms, and they'd stick it in the middle of the battlefield just to make the point. And 2,000 years later, Saddam Hussein, when he won the Iran-Iraq war, created his victory arch, and you've probably seen it on the television with its, its big sabers across the parade ground. What you don't see is that there are nets on either side filled with helmets from the war dead of the opposition. So that's trench art, anything that's been made from something that's been used in a war. But most trench art is not on this grand scale. It's very small, it's very personal. It might be made by a prisoner. Nowhere to go, too much time on their hands. It might be made by somebody in a combat zone, distracting themselves from the reality of today and their fears for the future. Or even just somebody in the services wanting to remember they're not a rank or a number, they're a real person with family, friends, and if they're a Freemason, brothers in their lodges. Our story starts over 200 years ago. Freemasons have been around war for all of the two or 300 years that they've existed, um, either as participants and serving soldiers or just where the war happened to happen. We're going to look at just three wars tonight. And we're going to start with the war against revolutionary and later Napoleonic France. 200 years ago, um, it was probably the first global combat because there was fighting in the Americas, in Europe, all the way into Russia, and on the seas, pretty much all the way around the globe. But today, we're gonna to start a little bit closer to home, Abergavenny, a small Welsh town near the border of England. If you'd been there in the early 1800s, you might have met a chap called Thomas Richard. He was a merchant, he was a Freemason, and being by all accounts a sociable chap, he probably would have offered you a pinch of snuff when you met. And you would have said, yes, thank you very much. Not because you wanted the powder tobacco particularly, but you wanted to see the box he'd offer it in. Because then you would work out, was he rich? Was he poor? Did he have good taste, bad taste? You could tell a lot about a snuff box. And if you'd met him, this is the box that you would have seen. And it's probably not what you're expecting. It's obviously been made with a lot of love, 
um, because you can see there's been a piece of horn put in there to protect it um, so that the picture doesn't get stained by the tobacco. But the pictures, oh, let's face it, it's not very good, is it? Um, ships of the period, Neptune commanding a seahorse. Well, I think it's a horse. So there's already a puzzle. Why is a prosperous merchant carrying a box like this? And if he shut it to show you the outside, this is what you would have seen. It's a carving representing the Masonic ceremony of the Royal Arch. And by now you realize even the materials are not expensive. This is bone, not ivory. And there's a misspelling, Royal Arch. It's spelled with an extra E and it's pronounced Royal Arch. And there's your clue. Because the maker of this box wasn't Welsh or English, he was French. A prisoner in Abergavenny, uh, a prisoner of those revolutionary and imperial wars. Thomas, by all accounts, was a friend of those prisoners. Um, he spoke fluent French and he used that ability to help them. The prisoners in those camps were basically on starvation rations. Um, the only way that they could find money to buy food and anything else that they needed was to make things and sell them to the local people. With uh, Thomas's help, they were able to do that. And when they all returned home at the end of the war, he was given two things, a beautiful bone ship, and that's now in a collection in America, and this snuff box, which is now in the Museum of Freemasonry as a memory of brotherhood and kindness. Items made by people in these camps were very popular with English Freemasons. And among the earliest items to enter our museum collections, I'll show you just a couple more before we move on. This workbox is decorated with straw and it folds down to look like a, a bound book. It shows symbolism from the very elaborate and extended ceremonies of French Freemasonry at the time. And it's beautifully made, but again from very cheap materials, the straw from the bedding on which the prisoners slept. Freemasons in the camps were actually allowed to form Masonic lodges and towards the end of the war, Thomas Richard actually joined one of them. The most commonly found item from these camps is a Masonic jewel or badge. They look like the typical Masonic jewels of the day with the columns and the Book of Sacred Law. But again, they're made with paper, they're made with bone, they're made with straw and even human hair. Sometimes as here, you can see they've got extra gold threads. And that's because towards the end of the war, these prisoners were running mini industries in the camps and they could invest in better materials. Jewels like these were often converted into karat pins, items for Freemasons to wear, and show solidarity with their imprisoned brothers. Most Masonic collections have at least one, as they were clearly treasured, and many, many survived as a result. The century that followed the Napoleonic Wars saw many conflicts, large and small. But tonight we're going to jump forward to the First World War, where people first found out about trench art. Many Freemasons were involved, both from the regular forces and in the later conscript forces. There was a Freemason casualty on the first Royal Naval ship to be sunk by a submarine, and over the period, more than a thousand died, and they're memorialized in Freemasons Hall in London. And now we can go to an object that most definitely did come from a trench. During the advance on Fleur in the Battle of the Somme, 18,000 members of the New Zealand division went into action. Nearly 6,000 were wounded, and more than 2,000 lost their lives. Among them was a New Zealand Freemason named John Tucker. He got to the first objective, the German switch trench, and found in it a German Mauser rifle. He took that back as a souvenir of an extremely grim um, and bitter day for the New Zealand forces. When he got back to his lines, he carved the wooden stock, the part that goes near your shoulder, into gavel heads. And at Masonic meetings in the division, behind the lines, but still in the sound of the guns, those gavels were used. We think it's just the head, just the top part of the gavel that was used. But many years later, now fitted with a beautifully turned handle and in a box of New Zealand wood, it was presented to a London lodge, St. Catherine's Park, as a thank you because they had hosted so many servicemen during the First World War. It's now been donated to the museum and it's very carefully preserved so that it'll last hopefully forever. But during the time with the lodge, 
the sound of it as it was used would have made a direct sensory connection between the members and their fellow Freemasons in the war zone. It must have been quite a remarkable thing to hear it in use. The First World War was not just about the trenches. It was also the first to use aeroplanes and airships as major combat weapons. Two lodges that formed in England are a very good illustration of this. Ad Astra Lodge was formed in the aerospace factory at Farnborough as a way to bond together men who'd come from all across the country to design new warplanes. When they formed, they converted the propeller of one of their creations into the collecting box and gavels for the lodge. These again are in the museum, and because the markings were left on, we've been able to identify the plane. It's an FE-2B, um, which was a very early fighter, which was later used as a night fighter. Um, if anybody's interested in biplanes, we can talk later. The lodge closed in the late 1990s, and these came into the museum, but their tracing boards, the pictures that illustrate the Masonic ceremonies, went on to our AF lodge, and they too are mounted on propellers and pieces of aeroplane engines. Royal Naval Anti-Aircraft Lodge, by contrast, was created by the Royal Naval Volunteers who manned mobile artillery to combat the menace of the Zeppelin airship raids and later the Gotha bombers. Clearly they had a creative streak because their neck badges or jewels are all made from metal salvaged from a crashed Zeppelin. Not probably one they shot down and their lodge consecration program was actually bound in fabric from an aeroplane wing. Even their collecting tin in the middle of this picture is a shell case decorated with the names of all the places in the home counties where they were stationed. After the war, they auctioned off the recognition models that they'd used to teach themselves not to shoot at the wrong planes and silver plated, they're still used as table decorations. This lodge still meets, still remembers its history and the objects are still with them, which is why this photograph is not quite as professional as some of the others. It was taken during an exhibition in 2002. We're very grateful to many lodges that they lend us their treasures so a much wider audience can see them. At the end of the war, on Armistice Day in 1918, Major General Sir David Watson of the Canadian Expeditionary Force visited Freemasons Hall in London. He brought with him gifts from the war zone. Gavel blocks made from the timber of the ruined Ypres Cathedral, one for Canada Lodge and one for the Grand Lodge Museum itself. Um, Professor Nick Saunders, who is the world specialist on trench art, thinks this may just have been the first piece of World War I trench art to go on display in a museum anywhere. Who knows? The significance of the block would have been well understood at the time. The destruction of Ypres in 1914, including the Guildhall and the Cathedral, was seen as totally barbaric and shocking. It was an indicator this would not be a normal war. There were five battles of Ypres, including one where poison gas was used for the first time. By 1918, the fighting had swung round to where it had begun, and Ypres was yet again in combat right up to the armistice. This block symbolised the whole war and the loss and sacrifice of everyone that served in it. In the aftermath, Freemasons Hall was rebuilt as the Masonic Peace Memorial, and the war dead of the United Grand Lodge of England were commemorated in it. The war to end wars, of course, didn't do that. And in the Second World War, Freemasons on the home front came to experience directly the effects of conflict. This is clearly shown in menus for lodge meals. In the First World War, the effects of the U-block boat blockade are really only evident very late on, whereas a typical menu for the Second World War has various phrases for, we'll eat whatever we happen to have. This talk has so far concentrated on Europe, but English lodges in the East suffered in the war with the Japanese Empire. Many Freemasons were captured in the fall of the island of Singapore, and the districts of Burma and Japan both disappeared. It was doubly ironic, because along with Buckinghamshire in England, they'd been the only Masonic regions, or districts, to qualify a district or provincial neck jewel commemorating support for building Freemasons Hall. And this is the shrine, which is our term for the memorial area for the war dead in Freemasons Hall, which was originally called the Masonic Peace Memorial. 
this was also a very different war for Freemasons with the Axis powers opposing Freemasonry in all its forms. It was a difficult time to be a Freemason. Trench art is much less common among the service for serving forces because it's a mobile war. They don't have much time to sit around and make things. But on the home front, we have many different items. In London, the Blitz of 1940 caused massive civilian casualties and also damaged and destroyed many historic buildings. The Guildhall of the City of London was totally destroyed and the Lord Mayor, himself a Freemason, had malls like this one made from the timber. A mall is a builder's mallet, which features in Masonic ceremony. Tom Purvis of the Incorporated Society of Musicians Lodge created gavels out of the choir roof timbers of St Paul's Cathedral in much the same way. Many of the items of our First World War I trench art were also donated during the Second World War, perhaps for safekeeping, but also maybe in a belief that better times would come and they would make a point to a wider audience if they were in the museum. The museum itself went into storage and the display gallery cases in our South Gallery still bear the scars from when the windows were blown in by a V1 doodle bog bug later in the war. At a smaller scale, many lodges lost meeting places. Tecton Lodge was one of many that lost its lodge possessions in a bombing raid. But their melted collecting plate was salvaged and immediately taken into use with a wooden repair. Very appropriate as Tecton is the lodge of the Carpenters Livery Company in the City of London. There are many things in the collections that reflect this wish to salvage things from bombed buildings, to keep going, to show that you're not defeated. Freemasons in the East suffered greatly under the Japanese occupation. Some in prisoner of war camps or on the Burma Railway and many civilians in the internee camp at Changi. It was a Freemason, Captain Douglas Pickersgill of the Royal Engineers, who made the gate for the cemetery at the camp. And that's now been transferred to the National Memorial Arboretum in the UK. He himself died in captivity on the Burma Railway. In Changi, in conditions of great deprivation, a lodge met in secret. And one of its members, J.R. Skipper, created these rank jewels from aluminium salvaged from a bombed out bus. They're one of the most iconic sets of objects in the museum, showing as they do Freemasonry continuing in extreme adversity. And among them on the bottom row is the Almoner's purse, just to the right of the swords. He was responsible for charity collection and distribution. That the Lodge still thought of others less fortunate is remarkable evidence of the principles of Freemasonry. And I've often said if I could save just one thing from the museum in a disaster, it would be this. It would be easy to stop the talk here on one of the most emotive objects in the museum, but that would leave you thinking of trench art as only able to be made long ago, but that's not true. During an official visit to the Solomon Islands, many years after the Second World War, a senior Freemason was given this mall by Melanesia Lodge, made especially for him. The wood came from the island of Santa Isabel and the brass decoration was a 1942 dated American Navy bullet case. These islands were the site of the brutal Guadalcanal campaign against the Imperial Japanese. And the gift combined wood from a tree that may have witnessed the fighting with an actual bullet fired during it. But it represented a memory of war as much as a reaction to it. Even more important was that the local Freemasons wanted this item to represent them in our collections. People are still using weapons to create art today. And more recently, um, after the Civil War in Mozambique, um, the Swords into Plowshares project created chairs and art forms from decommissioned weapons, one of which is now in the British Museum. Freemasons and the forces continue to experience combat. And it's tantalizing to me the maybe far more recent examples of trench art out there. I'll finish on this image of an artwork that I designed for our exhibition, Art of the Apocalypse. It features many of the objects and wars that we've heard about tonight, from the Union flag, the Waterloo and the Napoleonic battles to the left, to the camouflage and tank tracks of Bosnia and later wars on the right. 
our collections hold many items that allow us to connect with Freemasons in the past, their experiences and their lives. Trench art for me is among the most powerful of these. And there are many, many st more stories still to be researched and told. That I'm very certain. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Fantastic, Mark. Well done. I'll just do this on behalf of everyone. <laughs> oh, could you hear that, Mark? You have your... Excellent. Stop well, well, well done. I'll just do this on behalf of everyone. <laughs> Fantastic talk. Thank you so much, Mark. If you have a question for Mark, please post it in the chat. We will give you a, a bit of time just to type and to come up with questions. Wow, thanks, Mark. Fantastic. <laughs> mm. And again, although I didn't say it at the talk, of course, this next weekend is the 75th anniversary of VJ Day. Oh, of course, right. Yeah. So actually, that was, that was slightly in my mind. Yeah. How to finish it. Yeah. Let's, let's finish with the East which is in our minds this week. Oh, fantastic, fantastic. Thanks so much, Mark. Uh, we'll just give people a little time to, to type. Um, and I was wondering if I could kick off the questions, please. Uh, because you, you mentioned there that many of these objects started to emerge at the museum during or just after the Second World War. Why at this time specifically? I think it's because most of them were given to lodges and not to Grand Lodge itself. Um, if you look at the catalogue of the museum in 1938. There's just a few bits and pieces, the gavel blocks there, um, some things from Palestine, but mostly these were taken back to lodges to be treasures in memory of men who'd served. But as lodge lockers and lodge buildings started to be destroyed, I think they thought, well, rather than risk this stuff, we'll give it to the Grand Lodge Museum, which is now the Museum of Freemasonry, and there it's more likely to survive in our memory, in memory of the men, um, and to point a lesson, as indeed it has, um, because we've done a number of exhibitions with this material, and they can tell lots of different stories. Mm, indeed, very true. Um, Mark, I have a question for you here in the chat. How common were Masonic lodges in French prisoner of war camps in the British Isles? Relatively common. Um, Freemasons were allowed to meet. Um, in one case, they were actually allowed to meet um, the uh, acting Grand Master. Uh, so it did happen for quite a lot, um, and as I say, um, Thomas Richard um, actually joining that lodge in the POW camp, it was his second lodge, and the only one in town at the time. Uh, rather charmingly, it was called um, the Children of, of Mars, Mars and Neptune, which is about, about right for soldiers and sailors, uh, but a very different war, um, because bear in mind at that period, English and French Freemasons were very close, um, and they would very much have seen themselves as, as, as brothers, even though there was a war on. Indeed. Um, is there anything from the Italian uh, prisoner of wars held in Orkney during uh, the Second World War? Not in the collection at the moment. Um, we do have internally material, but not from there. Uh, it doesn't mean it didn't exist. Um, but again, you have to bear in mind that the Italian prisoners, um, Mussolini had shut down all the lodges. So they would be less likely to produce Masonic material. All right, yeah. There may well have been members amongst them, but... Um, one of, the, one of the things that, about this is there's material out there we don't know. It's in the lodges, it's unidentified. Um, in a, a Masonic Lodge building in London, I was looking at a, a collar and it had an Italian tag on it. I was thinking, was this exhibited under Mussolini, I wonder? So there's, there's stuff out there. Um, we just haven't found it yet. It's just like Korea, Falklands, Gulf. There were Freemasons in all those conflicts, but I don't have any material for them. Mm, very interesting. Uh, another question in the chat, Mark. Is there a publication about the Napoleonic Masonic art in England? Not one that's dedicated to it. Um, the nearest I can do, which is out of print, sorry, uh, is that which we produced about 20 years ago, Craft and Conflict, which illustrates a lot of the things that I've, I've spoken about today. Um, again, I, I gather from Martin, our librarian, that there is a lodge that inherited a lot of the material from that Abergavenny French Lodge. So if there's any authors out there, <laughs> we're always here to help. Good. Um, is there any information on German masonry and German officers within lodges? Again, we don't have much, we don't have trench art. Um, Freemasonry was very common um, in Germany after the First World War. And in fact, you do find after the war, things like iron crosses being embedded in lodge jewels. 
um, but what we don't have are the records um, after the persecution of, of German Freemasons. It's one of the things I've always wanted to do. I mean, we know and Nord Law Naval Anti-Aircraft were shooting the Zeppelins, but how many of the Zeppelin crews were Freemasons? Um, but it would take somebody working through the recovered German records such as they are to actually do that. Um, again, perhaps one day the German Masonic Museum in Bayreuth will, will have a go at that. Right, very good. Um, another one in the chat, Mark. Is it true that Freemasonry was hated by the Japanese in World War II so that many Masonic gatherings amongst uh, prisoners would have, to, uh, would have to take place in complete secrecy? Do we know anything about that? They did oppose it. Um, it got worse as the war went on. Um, initially, they weren't quite certain, but you could sort of do it. Um, but eventually, the Japanese Secret Service focused on it and thought it was probably a bad thing. And at that point, the Changi Lodge shut down. Um, so they weren't, they weren't against it as a point of principle. They were against it for what it might be able to do and what it might represent. Um, obviously, Jap Japanese Freemasonry was essentially Western. It had never really gone inland. Mm. Um, so, you know, a slightly, diff slightly different world. Um, but yes, everything was shut down. It was very, very dangerous to be a Freemasonry under the Japanese occupation towards the end. Mm. Right. Um, Mark, there is something about these everyday objects because they, they kind of really require the personal story behind the object. But mm. do we always have that? I wish we did. Yeah. Uh, one of the reasons I picked the ones today is we mostly know who made them, who bought them. Um, things that come out of lodges, very often we do know. Um, or at least we know that we know why they happened. Um, but it wasn't the tradition of museums always to capture stories until relatively recently. Um, and obviously, once an object has got loose from its lodge or its family, you know, if you see these, things, these very personal things, you know, the bullet with the name on, you know, that was my husband's, he died in the war, goes down to, that was granddad's, didn't he serve somewhere? And then it's in a boot fair and the guy's name is John. And you, you see the knowledge of these objects just kind of filtering away, um, which is another reason why now if, if something comes in, we're, we're very, very keen to capture everything. I mean, even, the, even if it's wrong, um, when I wrote this talk we thought Richards was called John uh, and was a tiler and then we, we looked him up on Ancestry and our own records and no he isn't he's Thomas so but that was the family legend so all the information we had came from the family and they they told us about the bone ship yeah. so um, researching it's fun just don't always believe everything you're told and, and complicated, yes, true, very true. Um, Mark, returning to your talk there, you mentioned uh, something about an object made out of a zeppelin. Can you say more about that? And yes. How, um, how it was made out of a zeppelin? Um, basically, there were a number of zeppelins shot down. Uh, one at Potter's Bar, the L31, Heinrich Matthies um, ship, survived pretty much intact. And the British military managed to grab the code machine. But you then had 800 feet, whatever that is in meters, of lightweight aluminium frame and not much to do with it. And what happened is a lot of it was sold for the war effort. And Royal Naval Anti-Aircraft got a quantity of it and melted it down to make their neck badges, because this, after all, was what they've been shooting at. Um, and the image of their uh, snuff box, it's actually part of the sort of piston head, um, part of the engine. Um, but you do find a lot of that. Royal, um, Ad Astra also had a gavel made it, but they, they put the wrong Zeppelin on the front. Never mind. The, the, the one they say they've got was a totally different sort of airship made of wood. Oddly enough, there wasn't much left after it was shot down. So we think it's probably out of Matty's, Matty's L31 as well. Um, again, they wanted a gavel head made from the very first airship ever shot down. So somebody sold it to them. Fair enough. Fantastic. Fantastic news. Um... Mark, is there any, you mentioned this a little bit, but is there anything in the collection from, for example, the Falkland War or the Gulf War at all? No, nothing. Um, and that is a sadness. Um, whether the stuff in armed services lodges, possibly. Because again, there's certainly for the First World War, there's lots out there. Royal Naval Lodge has got um, a rum, miniature rum tub made from one of the ferries that was commandeered for the Zeebrugge raid in the First World War, and on and on it goes. Um, but I'm rather hoping there is stuff but I'm also hoping it's in lodges that live long enough that I don't live to see it come out into the museum because they've gone. Although if you'd like to tell me about it, please. Indeed. Um, I always have to finish this talk in 1945 and you think it's quite a long while ago, actually. 
Uh, that brings me to what, actually, what is the oldest war object in the collection? Ah, uh, well, it nearly features in the talk. Um, we have a builder's mallet or maul, um, and it was made from a demolished lodge hall in Scotland. Why is that war art? Because allegedly the timber from that hall was um, salvaged from a, a wrecked ship of the Spanish Armada, 1588. So if we believe it, that's, that's the oldest object. Wow. <laughs> there's, not, there's, there's nothing else quite beats that. After that, you have to wait until the Napoleon it was. Oh, good. It's very good. D does the museum still co collect war objects? But, but do we have anything from more recent wars or conflicts? No. Um, we do still collect. Yeah. We have um, a collections committee that meets quarterly or ad hoc if it needs to. Um, for, but very much things with stories that tell you something about Freemasonry and Freemasons. Um, so again, if anything more recent turned up, we would certainly consider it. Uh, but again, we can't display everything. Um, so it would form part of rotating displays, part of our display program. But it would always be there, um, always accessible to researchers and anybody who wanted to see it. Very good. Um, Mark, there is, uh, well, it's not a question really in the chat. It's, it's, it's more, um, it's more like a comment, really, uh, to the Napoleonic War part of the talk. Mm -hmm. A large, bigger free operative, number six, uh, uh, sorry, 167 in Scotland, still uses warden's chairs made by friends prisoner of wars after their return to France in gratitude from their fraternal treatment. Fantastic. That's, <laughs> and it says it's, they're not comfortable to sit in, but that's not the point, is it? <laughs> Well, they were grateful, but, you know, there's a limit to how grateful prisoners can be, but fantastic. This is exactly the sort of stuff we love. Um, as I said, we've not, I'll happily, hurriedly say we haven't got much from Scotland, otherwise you, it's, you're going to come for us, aren't you? Um, but we do, we do have a Black Watch, 42nd Highlander, um, April yeah. Scots Constitution, um, which is the right period to have served in the peninsula, maybe even at Waterloo. Uh, but again, it hasn't come in with a name. They never do. That's very good. That's really interesting. Um, Mark, are there any uh, objects that um, you want to mention from the collection that you may not have time to to uh, to get through in your talk today? There's Anything all sorts. Of, there's all sorts of stuff from the Victorian period. I mean, I just jumped straight from Napoleonic to First World War because otherwise, you know, you'd be listening to me for hours. Um, there's there's things like a horse's hoof, mounted up, presented by Freemasons to their landlord, himself a Freemason. Uh, why that hoof? I like to think it's one of the um, one of the things from the Charge of the Light Brigade, but again, it's a hoof. Uh, so there's, there's all sorts of stuff like that. And again, in the Boer War, um, there were prisoners in St Helena, and they produced a lot of trench art, Masonic trench art. Um, and there are a number of people, private collectors, who have them. We don't. And there's some amazing things that were made because again, it was commercial. You know, they would produce stuff to make money to live. Um, and there it actually got so competitive, they actually had to issue certificates of authenticity because the locals were knocking out um, for trench art because it wasn't that difficult to do. But it was the fact that it was made by the prisoners themselves. Um, and one of the other things in all of this is authenticity. Mm. It Was it made by the commercial after the war? Is that worth less than a man doing it under fire? I'd say yes, but then I'm a storyteller and I like to sort of feel objects. Um, that they actually have an effect or an affect, as we sometimes say. You see them and you feel something. I see. Um, there is one here in the chat, Mark. I just want to make sure I, I get it right. It's about the Welsh uh, Mason who support, supported the French uh, prisoner Masons. Um, what, uh, sorry, what does his own compatriots feel, uh, uh, patriots feel about that? The only way you'd find out would be look at the minute books. I don't know if they survive. Um, certainly they wouldn't for the French Lodge. Um, but he remained a Freemason in town um, and he picked up his Freemasonry over the next few years. So clearly they weren't against him doing it. Uh, and again, the prisoners became part of the town because France had a conscript army as well. You know, anybody, a young man, great, you're fighting for Napoleon, off you go. Um, so there were there'd have been lace makers, carpenters, smiths, a mini industry um, and the camp itself was not small so people in the town would have been providing for them making the buildings um, they the officers very often 
as well would have been given parole, which means they would be allowed to go into town to meet people, provided they promise not to escape. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Didn't always work. Okay. There we go. Um, so my feeling is probably he was all right with it. Um, it was a very different war. Um, and one of the oddities is that's probably one of the very few times when the Welsh and the English got to meet the French, you know, the great enemy of centuries and they're walking down the high street. Um, so again, you know, you do wonder whether that got something going that people understood them more. Um, I'm a touch francophone, you know, so hey, allowances. Very, very, very interesting. Um, Mark, wait, I think we are about to end, but just the final questions. Uh, where can we find out more about these objects? If we want to, anyone wants to dive sort of deeper into this, where can they go? Um, there's various books published by Nick Saunders. Um, if you go online, Nicholas J. Saunders, um, he's the specialist. Um, as I say, Craft and Conflict published by us, but now out of print. Um, there is stuff in the museum if you want to come and research. And again, if you want to ask that question to our website, you know, I'm sure we can help you a bit more than we can on, on a chat when I'm sat at my desk at home. Oh, to be able to reach to the bookshelf and just answer your question. This has been as, as good as having you in person. <laughs> Mark, thank you so much. Uh, we are almost out of time, I'm afraid. I want to say thank you so much to Mark for a brilliant talk. Thank you to Louise for technical support. And thank you to all of you for joining us and for your questions tonight. I hope you will join us again because we will be back on Monday, the 24th of August at 7.30 p.m. British time with Louise Pichel, our assistant archivist at the Museum of Freemasonry. And we will be going back to school with Louise as she takes us through some interesting stories from the old Masonic school records. So please join us, it will be very exciting. The link to register is available on our website. If you want to find out more about our exciting work, then please visit the Museum of Freemasonry's website and sign up for our newsletter. For now, thank you so much and have a nice evening.